meeting is being recorded for posterity, so please keep the swearing to a minimum. Um, and and <laughs> to our final parent university session of the year, not final in its entirety, but certainly um, the, the last one before we head into summer. Summer is around the corner, even though yeah. as we look outside uh, in the mornings, it certainly doesn't feel like summer. Right. But it is yet. on our doorstep. It is it yes. is knocking at the door. And I'm really glad that you are able to join us uh, for this last uh, workshop because it really is um, uh, wonderfully cumulative. So everything that we've talked about, everything we've talked about in terms of um, understanding the cognitive elements and the socio-emotional elements and adolescent behavior and motivation, it all really folds uh, quite nicely. Uh, into this, and you'll see that uh, the title of this presentation uh, is the meandering path. And you know, we talked about demystifying the admissions process, um, but you know, one of the things that I've always thought about when I thought about college is not whether one is ready for college, but is college ready for you? So I think there are two ways of looking at it. And um, with, with our, our kids, we can look at changing our perspectives and changing our, our mindsets. And again, everything is really leading to this point as um, attendance at college and university is perhaps our, our next step on our life's pathway. And again, um, we are now in our last session in a very different world than we were in the first session. Uh, the first session, we were worried about whether we would see vaccines, whether they would be available. We were worried about what kinds and colors of masks and where to, where to wear them and how to wear them. Do I have them on right? Um, and uh, now we're looking at something different. We are not only looking at going back to school, but we're also looking at going back to the University of California campus. So this is just a wonderful time to be able to talk to you all about this. And of course, this is going to be available using my slide share. And I know that this is being recorded for posterity, uh, but if you would like to find it uh, on my site, please uh, do just search my name and you will be there in a flash. And as was the case last week and the month before that, and, and since the very beginning, um, we always circle back to these recurring themes of head, heart, and hands. And whatever we do, whatever we suggest, whatever approach we uh, use will be somehow connected to head, heart, and hands and the wonderful intersection between those things, um, which is high performance. Now, when we're talking about college admissions, especially, we talk about high performance perhaps on uh, college entrance exams, which are not being used currently by uh, the University of California as we kind of try to sort ourselves out because we realized um, that the SAT and the ACT were not the best predictors of success in college. There were a lot of other things uh, involved, but um, the University of California is never one to miss out on an opportunity, so we're looking at our own exam. But you know, not everybody will head to the University of California. But um, again, when we talk about high performance, we usually talk about exams and we talk about grades. But um, we also want to talk about living a joyful life, and especially as we head into a new phase of our life, which may be college or university, we want to do so confidently and competently and with a real sense of joy about it. So again, everything needs to be good for heart, good for head, and good for hands. And if it's not that, uh, then you may want to reevaluate. And as we talk about this journey, I'm going to share a lot about my own journey, which may lead some insight, which may cause parents either to shudder or breathe a sigh of relief, um, and perhaps um, lend a, a, a little bit less trepidation to, to kids who are approaching it. And I was struck by a, a quote by Madison Taylor, who was talking about um, what, what do we mean by a meandering path? And she said, if you trek into the wilderness and you look around with a careful gaze, you will see that the trees, flowers, and even the rocks have a tendency to flow. 
Now, remember, we talked about flow um, quite extensively in, in our, our, our prior workshops. And there is a curve of the branch that leads to the blossom, the smooth dip in a rock formation, the gnarled knot in a tree trunk, and the forking of shoots. As nature is overflowing with curves, corners, and knots in unexpected directions, so are our lives filled with unpredictable twists and turns. And you might say, well, that's great. That's very poetic. That's beautiful. But so what? Um, what I will tell you is that when I was growing up as a young lad in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, I was always led to believe that the path to college, and it was expected of me, both of my parents um, worked for colleges. My father was a, a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and at UC San Francisco, which probably explains a lot about me. Um, he was actually a psychoanalyst, and um, it was always portrayed as a very straight pathway. You do this, then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. I was not prepared for turns in my own life, and I think that we have kids out there who are very worried because they expect that if it's not a straight pathway, then it's not worth it, or they've made some kind of mistake. And what I wanna do is to be able to share my own story in the hopes that um, it will help kids and, and parents better understand um, that you do wind up where you're supposed to be and you do wind up in a good place. Now, I will tell you, and you may remember from the adolescent behavior presentation, I was a very bad child, um, I really, I mean, I did set a standard for, you know, bad behavior and for worrying my parents. So I was good at something. In high school, my GPA was 1.3. I did not connect at all with high school. Um, I often thought of myself as a rebel without a cause, but I was more like a rebel without a clue. I don't know what I was angry at, but I was certainly angry at it and everybody else around me suffered. I engaged in the typical adolescent shenanigans, all of those things that we discussed in the adolescent behavior workshop. I did that and more. I was actually in a band with a, a when I was in high school with um, two of our other members went on to actual great fame and fortune in the music industry. And I told them that they were talentless and um, that uh, they should not be playing music and um, got out of that. And as a result, here I am. And I was very defiant. This was the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s. And I was really directionless. I had no clue what I was doing. And I had a merciful counselor in high school. She knew where I was going. She could see the direction I was heading. And she said, look, for the benefit of the school and for the benefit of you, we're going to come to an accord. If you can go to a community college over the summer and just eke out a C. If you can take three classes and just don't let your GPA dip below 2.0, we'll let you out of here. Sweeter words I had never heard. Now, I know this is not the case in E3. So I'm just letting you know, I went to a public school. It was uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, it was a very different environment, but I did that. And I wound up at Contra Costa College, which it was just east of us. Um, I, I grew up in Alameda County. It was in Contra Costa County, hence the name. And the thing that impressed me was the lack of bells. And during the early 1980s, the presence of ashtrays. I thought, ah, sweet freedom. I can go where I want, when I want. I, I'm not, I really am not beholden unto everybody. So I had my first epiphany that I could actually do this, that I that school and I could agree on something. And I actually excelled at Contra Costa College. I felt a, you know, freedom and I finally felt engaged. I finally understood math. I was um, put into a set design class because I couldn't get into a performing arts class. So I went into set design and everything they were trying to teach me about trains leaving at different times and equations and graphs and, and angles, it finally all made sense. And I felt confident and I felt competent. And I went, hey, maybe this is something I can do. And remember when we were talking about adolescent behavior in the adolescent brain, we were talking about that being necessary. What I did from there, I did not 
I, did, I had a mini epiphany, which means that it wasn't a very smart one. So I realized that I could do it, but I thought that my fortune somehow uh, was at community college. So I would drift from one to the next, expecting my life to be transformed. And I just wound up seeing the same people I saw in high school um, that I didn't like. It did not have the profound life transformation that I was looking for. So I bounced around. Uh, hence, you will see uh, that I was the wanderer. So I'd wander from place to place. I'd get on, I'd get on our, our subway system, the, the BART, and I'd go across the lake. I'd go into Oakland, and I'd go into San Francisco. Um, and I wound up at a bunch of junior colleges really going nowhere. But I was looking for new. We talked about the brain always seeking out novelty, socio-emotionally looking for novelty. And I was really starting to better understand independence and all that it meant. And I said, OK, maybe it's time that I get serious. And if I really want to see a change, I've got to cross the bridge. Now, in New York, that means something entirely different. But in the Bay Area, it means going across either the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge. And I went across the Bay Bridge to San Francisco State University, stayed there for about a year. And that is really where I started thinking um, quite heavily about what it means to be on your own. Um, I, I was starting to go down that path. And what happened to me is I wound up getting a job because I needed to support myself. And I started to rise through the ranks of this job. Now, it is not an impressive job. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, I became a, a neurosurgeon. Um, I was actually working in a retail establishment. And if any of you were around, maybe it's not the case for any of you, but if any you were around in the 1980s, there was a retail clothing store called Aka Joe. And what you see there is the kind of garb that we used to produce. For some reason, we always cut the sleeves off of things and we cut the necks off of things. Um, but I was doing well there. I became what was called a key holder, which means that I could lock up in the afternoon. And I was thinking, maybe my future doesn't lie in post-secondary education. Maybe it lies in the workforce. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that. But it's important to remember that on this pathway, there is going to be a lot of detours and there are going to be a lot of temptations. There's going to be the siren song of of money and, and things like that. And I was actually offered a position as a store manager. Bear in mind that this store no longer exists, so I probably dodged a bullet there. But I was offered a job in a place that might as well have been another country, a place called Pasadena. Now, I didn't know anything about Pasadena. I grew up in Northern California. I just knew that it was by Los Angeles. And I really had to have a very, very uh, big think in the spring of 1986. Was I going to go ahead and, and manage a retail store in a mall? Or did I want to do something different? And I will have you know that the one thing I did not want to do from high school on was follow in my father's footsteps or follow in my mother's footsteps. The last thing that I wanted to do was anything in education. I wanted nothing to do with the University of California. I grew up in Berkeley, I had seen enough. Um, and whatever the opposite of that was, that's what I wanted to do. But, oops, hold on a second. Let me just close out of this. I finally had an epiphany and went into the family business. Um, what you see there, that is my father. That is Kenneth Appel. He was a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco. I did not know much about his pathway to college. He grew up in Detroit, Michigan. He worked the auto line at GM during the 1950s before going to Wayne State. Um, and he bounced around. I don't know what his exact path was, but it was not straight. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier on is our quest for an independent identity, and we'll revisit that. Um, but for some of us, the epiphany doesn't come until later. Some of us really aren't sufficiently mature to undertake going to a big campus where you could get lost. And I know that if I was on my parents' timeline, it probably would not have gone well. So this idea... Uh, about not only supporting 
grades and supporting coursework, but also supporting the socio-emotional. So you are mature, sufficiently mature to make good decisions. So that was my dad's path. It was unknown, but it wasn't straight. Um, I had a meandering path, which you've seen. My sister, however, took a very different path. She was a, a straight path. She went from Yale to Stanford to a uh, postdoc at Columbia to uh, an assistant professor of sociology at UCLA just got tenure. So we all wound up in the family business. Me dragged kicking and screaming, my dad by happenstance and my sister purposefully. So this is also to say if, if you, you know, have uh, any number of children, if they're brothers and sisters and siblings, they may not all follow the same path. My path really sort of got solidified in 1987. So it really took a few years for me to figure it out. And I had to do it on my own. And part of this um, process is an epiphany based process. We go back to this graphic that you've seen a, a number of times, but we see that all of the time in different contexts. Um, now we know that when we think of adolescence and, you know, as they are growing up, they are thinking primarily of the present. Not because they don't care about the future, but that's where their heads are. Uh, uh, neurobiologically, they are focused on the present. When we say in two years, you know, you're going to have to start thinking about applying to school, that might have as well be a century away because that's how their conception of time is. But what you will see here is, is, is quite valuable is that our, our brains are most malleable when we are younger. And what we wanna be able to do is make sure that post-secondary education, uh, be it community college, state college, private college, university, that it feels familiar, that the transitions are seamless, where it doesn't feel necessarily like it is going to be a sea change, but it is going to be a new and exciting an adventure. So what does that mean? As early as possible, start providing positive experiences with college. Now, um, Dr. Ward certainly knows this because you know we have uh, college coursework that's, that's offered at E3. We have programs that are offered. So if there are E3 students who come to us, it's not like landing on a foreign planet. What it's like, it's like, okay, this is the next logical step in the journey. And it's our responsibility as post-secondary institutions um, to go on that journey with kids, you know, from a very young age that we all walk together, not just we receive people after they come out of high school, but it's really incumbent upon us to make the university a um, welcoming environment. There are always going to be pressures, both implicit and explicit. And there are going to be times when you're going along and suddenly you just kind of lose it and you can come back to it. It's also important to understand that college is about goodness of fit and opportunity for emotional and cognitive development. Now, my mom, my parents were divorced early, so my mom raised me as a single parent. And when we spoke to my sixth grade counselor, she said, it's either going to be Harvard, Yale, or, um, you know, Annapolis. That was it. That was sort of my range of choices. So imagine being a sixth grader, not even having a conception of what Harvard or Yale was, except that they're really difficult, um, and, and trying to deal with those pressures and knowing that even though my mom would always say, yeah, well, no, no, whatever you get into is fine. Whatever you want to do with your life, we want to make sure you're happy. I knew that behind the scenes, she was going, it's got to be Harvard, Yale, or Annapolis. So again, the, the, the point here is that you start early, positive experiences with college. Um, and, and, you know, again, it's also incumbent upon our faculty to make sure that they are good exemplars and good role models and share their stories, especially, um, you know, how they got to where they are. Now, a lot of this, again, has to do with our own identity development, and a lot of this happens at in within adolescence. And when we look at that, most adolescents are here in this um, 
area of identity diffusion, where they're trying to settle on an identity. And of course, when you are a freshman and a sophomore and a junior, if you are not sort of settled that you see your identity as a college student later on, it is going to be difficult for you to, to reconcile. Um, we also have to worry sometimes uh, with foreclosure. So this idea that I'm not even gonna try different types of things. Um, my dad went to Brown and I'm gonna go to Brown or my dad went to Brown, so I am not going to go to Brown. Making a decision without any experience, without any consideration. And usually we find ourselves in the state of moratorium. Now it says in crisis, and I don't mean crisis in the traditional sense, but that we're really trying to figure out who we are and where we fit, is there a place for us? And unfortunately, our campuses don't do a great job of making people feel incredibly welcome. So this idea of finding an identity and achieving an identity that's distinct from your parents, but also includes your family. Because one of the things we know that when, even if you are sending a kid to college, everybody goes. It's, it's you know, you may be sending one kid um, off to the dorms at UC San Diego, but you know what? Siblings go too, parents go too, and colleges and universities have to understand that this is a family endeavor. And what we try to do at UC San Diego is provide opportunities for all members of the family to participate, whether it's through a, a parent experience like this, or whether it's providing um, opportunities for younger siblings to connect uh, to the university. So it is also our responsibility to help contribute to shaping I identity. Now. Along with that, we think about motivation. And, and last time we talked about motivation in, in some detail, but it, it takes on a different context here. Um, and we know that it's related to identity development and we know that it is complex, multifaceted and dynamic. So what does it mean to be motivated to go to college? What are your motivators? And I, you know, we spoke about um, intrinsic motivators we also spoke about extrinsic motivators. So is receiving a scholarship, for example, an extrinsic or an intrinsic motivator? And we know that motivation will push us along. It's sort of innate. Um, and we have an instinctual drive uh, to, uh, to move forward. And we have an, an instinctual drive to give energy and direction to our behaviors. Um, but the last time we talked about intrinsic motivations and extrinsic motivations, and the idea here is as early as possible, start taking some of the extrinsic motivators and convert them into intrinsic. So what's an extrinsic motivator? Well, maybe it's a visit to the campus. Maybe it's something from the bookstore. Maybe it's the ability to sit in on a class. But where you start then finding it is that the, the idea of going to college in and of itself is the reward. Seeing yourself there is the reward. So again, it has to do with motivation. And again, when we talk about motivational theories, um, it's important that we make sure that when we are talking about getting motivated for post-secondary education, that we are able to attend the most basic of needs first. So people are, you know, our kids are not going to be thinking about um, college essays if they don't feel secure or safe, or if they feel alone. Again, this is a, a collaborative effort. So it's not just parents and teachers and schools, but it's also universities who have to play a role early on to say, yes, you belong here. You know, this, this idea of belongingness and love and, and friendship you belong with us and we are going to help you get there. So we talked about Maslow the last time and we talked about um, this idea of expectancy theory. And really the important part of expectancy theory comes into play here is um, outcomes and, and value of the outcomes. So it's very important to build out resilience. And I know that is something that is, is done every day at E3, where we are in a place where we can say, yes, I can do this. I can do college level work. I can write a compelling essay. 
Um, so taking care of the can do, but then what factors in is what am I going to get from this? And it doesn't always have to be an extrinsic reward. Um, it could be the, the, the thrill of, of going and how, where do you place a value, which is the, the, the balance of it. So the idea here is really to think about motivation in a very different way. That is why early connections to college and knowing that you can do this type of work early on will at least get you a third of the way there. And as we spoke before, we also know um, that uh, we can look at attribution theory as a way to understand confidence and understand competence in terms of those things that our kids feel that are in their control or out of their control. And uh, we can work on um, you know, changing their mindsets about those things that are in control, where they may feel as though I only have a certain level of smarts. I only have a certain level of ability. Well, no, we know that that's uh, not true. We know how the brain works and we know that um, it is both nature and nurture. So really what we're talking about is really doing a lot of work to build out a, a sense of, of confidence. And we know that there are a number of reasons that, um, that kids don't th even think about college. Um, no one in their family has gone to college. And it seems like it is either not something that's possible. None of us have done it before. I'm probably not going to be the first one to do it, but there is also a lot of pressure on the first one to go or the first one to try. So what we try to do um, at, at UC San Diego is really go with this assumption that if one goes, everybody goes. This is a family endeavor. This does not mean that the family is always with the student at the campus because the student should be free to enjoy the campus and explore their independence and really become immersed in the campus culture. But we understand that, that family is a, a very important support. So why not have parallel activities for younger siblings who may come later so they feel a part of it? Why not have uh, sessions for parents where parents can also work um, with a different part of the university to earn credit or to earn certification? So maybe you, know, you will be the first in your family, but you know what? You can take everybody with you as well. Um, and that is a different way of thinking. Um, and I, you know, I, you can probably go to different college campuses and you may not uh, see the same thing. Think the college will be too hard or you won't get in. So sort of setting yourself up for failure or don't know how to choose a college. Uh, there are so many options out there now it, it, it's difficult to choose. If you are a multi-potentiate or if you've been admitted to so many, it's hard to know how to choose. How do you make an educated and informed decision? Um, being away from family and the familiar, again, that is uh, something that um, we try to, to mitigate the impacts of or think that they can't afford college. Um, there are a lot of supports that are available. Um, at UC San Diego, for example, we have the Chancellor's Associate Fellowship Program. Um, for those who ad are admitted into STEAM majors, there is a, um, a, a fellowship that you can earn that doesn't matter how long you stay, you, they will pay for you as long as you um, meet the requirements. So there are different ways of affording colleges. And of course, the language and hidden codes of college. Now I had two parents, both of them attended university, both of them um, uh, finished doctorates. Um, and I didn't know all of the codes. I didn't know, I didn't know all of the codes until I actually got there and, 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 and learned them. But again, moving away to college or applying to college is almost like moving to a different country with a different geography, with different people, with a whole set of different customs and, and languages. So that is a reason that, uh, a number of reasons that people don't go. But what are some of the deeper questions that you should be asking? Not so much where do I wanna to go to school or where's the closest school, but 
how, what is it that I want from life and where does a college education fit in? And I don't mean this sort of as an instrumental, uh, you know, effort where you say, okay, I want to make X amount of money and I need to go do this to get there. But really, when you think of life more broadly, where does it fit in? What do you know about college and what life will be like? Well, there are a lot of movies out there that portray what college life is like. And I think that kids have expectations about what college life is going to be like. And they are usually extreme. Either it's going to be one big four-year party or it is going to be you know, a, a very trying experience. But again, early immersion, early exposure lessens the trepidation about that. What are your reasons for going? And these are honest conversations that, that kids have to have them with themselves. Are you going because your parents want you to go or because you're expected to go? Or are there other reasons? Uh, you want to find yourself, you, 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 I mean, it could be anything. Um, what is the value of post-secondary education. And when we talked about expectancy theory, we talk about the, the sort of um, what value do you place on this and where does it take you? What are my interests and in learning styles? How do I learn best? And people really don't think a lot about that. Um, but if you are not a good visual or auditory learner, if you are a non-traditional learner, coming to a lecture hall with 300 other kids in it may not be your best way of learning, especially the first year out. Maybe you are better suited for a, a smaller uh, liberal arts college. And are you ready to make the four-year investment? And that doesn't mean necessarily tuition. This means taking four years or maybe five, sometimes six years out of your life. Um, and what are the alternatives? Now, I would at 18 have never admitted that I was not mature enough to handle a, a big college campus. I was too susceptible to be drawn in by other things, but I would have never admitted it to myself. Because I was compelled to go to community college because of my GPA, that's where I did a lot of my maturing. Um, so I think there are questions about um, what kinds of, of things could you do? Well. Do I want to try out college? Maybe I want to go earn a certificate first, or maybe I want to go for two years of community college first, rather than, uh, or take a gap year, or, or look at other alternatives. Um, we tend to make these uh, decisions very quickly. And there, I mean, you know, you get brochures. I, there's nothing like getting a letter that says, congratulations with brochures. And you're just like, that's the one. And then later on, you're like, no, 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 I should have done this one instead. Um, it, is, it is very easy uh, to get drawn in. And I think the way that we look at admissions is different. When I was applying to colleges in the Stone Age, it was, what is your GPA? What are your test scores? Um, what sort of extracurriculars have you been involved in? And what are your letters? And it, and it was basically, we're just going to kind of, you know, rank order you. Now, when we look at UC San Diego, when, when we ask, well, what kind of students are you looking for? They say, we're looking for fearless innovators, bold risk takers, those with a compulsive urge to take things apart, discover what makes them tick, put them back together again in surprising new ways, people who are eager to swap ideas, share experiences, and explore the world with a fresh perspective. If that sounds like you, start building your future at UC San Diego. What you do not see there is GPA X, test scores X. So I think we are beginning now, you, I, Dr. Ward, I'm sure knows um, that um, universities can often move at a glacial pace, and it's very hard to break with some of our deep-rooted traditions, but we are beginning to look at things a bit more holistically. I think this pandemic has also taught us a, a, a little bit about that, um, but, but again, you get a real sense of uh, what a university is is all about. Um, 
what are some of the things that you can do? Now, of course, if you have adole adolescence, and I remember being that age, uh, you know, uh, I think my parents, for the best of their intentions, they would say water is wet, and I would say, no, it's not, just because, you know, that's, that's how I was built. Uh, so what can you do um, without feeling as though you are being um, overly burdensome or draconian or nagging? Well, one of the things is to be a good listener. Not necessarily jump in and solve a problem, but just listen. When your, your kid talks about school and some of the fears that she has about school, listen. Be a cheerleader. You know, let them know that they can do it. So always listen. Always be a cheerleader. Now, help with goal chunking. We talked about chunking a long ago in um, our uh, brain compatible learning, our, our, brain, our brain science workshop where we talked, and we actually, I think we talked about it when we were looking about at going back to school, this idea that this whole college admissions and going to college, it is a huge, overwhelming um, tidal wave size task. And, it, and you know, even our, our best and brightest can look at it and go, I don't think I can do it. It's too much. But if you can help them break things down into smaller, more manageable goals, you know, well, first order some brochures, go online, take a look, get that goal done. Because remember, when we complete something, our brain gives us the sort of neurochemical cocktail that says, hey, you finished the task on to the next, good for you. So breaking things into smaller bites, um, it, you know, the same way that it works with teaching and learning is the same way that it works with college interface. Um, same thing with a roadmap. You know, it can get uh, to look like a big labyrinth after a while. You know, you, you start thinking, okay, go to go to college. Well, what am I going to do? What am I going to major in? I don't know. What's a, you know, I'm not really sure what a major is and where am I going to live? And it just starts growing and growing and growing. You can do with your kids to say, okay, yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's a big maze, but let's start cutting a pathway forward. So help them create a, a clear roadmap. It helps, it's the same with chunking, you know, this idea of let's start out by looking at what, you know, your first choice is. Let's, let's just take a look at them. After that, we'll do X. After that, we'll do Y. Now, sometimes motivation you know, motivational speaking can feel like nagging for a parent. And you really are, are there with the best of intent and you want to be a cheerleader, but you're like, hey, have you thought about this school? Or have you already submitted your application? They're going, mom, mom, enough, I'll get to it. So what you can do is look to transfer the motivation responsibility to others. Could be another member of the family. It could be a sibling. It could be a friend that takes responsibility. It could be a college counselor. It could be an admissions counselor who takes on some of that motivational burden and then taps into the key motivators. So really, what is the stuff that's going to get your kid interested and interested in a particular school? Just a few suggestions. Um, finding the right fit. Now, again, long ago, the right fit defined by my parents was you have three choices and if you don't if, if you don't get into one of them then it's not the right fit for you and how do we know it's not the right fit for you because we're your parents and you're genetically connected to us and it's not the right fit for us not the right fit for you um but really now um college attendance and and is is a matter of fit as much as anything else we can feel tempted to rush the process and that's why we always say start as early as possible um, so you don't have to rush through. Um, don't be a follower. Now, I don't necessarily mean don't follow a team or don't follow uh, that, that, that sort of thing, but people will tend to go where their friends go because they are worried about um, interruption of routine. Will I be able to make new friends somewhere else? What if it's out of state? What if it's far away? So the idea here is you don't need to follow your friends where they go. You can be an independent thinker. Some 
will go to sweatshirt schools. Why are you going to UCLA? Well, because I like their team and I like their sweatshirt and we've always been fans of UCLA. Doesn't mean you have to go to UCLA. Doesn't mean you don't have to go to UCLA, um, but you don't necessarily want to attend a, an institution because they have a good team and you're a fan. Um, judging a book by its cover, sometimes um, the physical attributes of a campus. So you may look at Yale and you may look at Harvard and say, well, those look like universities. And then you may look at another school, which is absolutely incredible, but say, well, that doesn't look like a real campus to me. Or I've looked through the brochure and I've seen the kinds of kids who are here and that doesn't appeal to me. So it's very important not to judge a book by its cover. Always look um, differently. Think about the social atmosphere. One of the problems I experienced at San Francisco State, it was very much a commuter campus um, where people did not stick around. There was not a vibrant social atmosphere. And for somebody who was craving that at my age, um, it was a problem. This is not to say you want to seek out a party school, but make sure that there are um, activities and opportunities to get to know people. Um, do not assume the worst. I think it's easy to um, you know, worry that you're not going to get in anywhere. That is usually not the case. Um, cost obsessions or carelessness, two sides of the same coin. Uh, where you can be very, very concerned about how much everything is going to cost um, without looking at sources of support or just saying, anywhere I get in, I'm going to go. You know, I don't care if it's $300,000 a year, as long as I get in, I'm going um, and not really thinking about how you're going to do it. Parent or peer pressure, I experienced a lot of that I, on both ends. And then relying on reputation alone. There's a lot to be said for reputation, but they're all colleges and universities have something um, really amazing about them. So go beyond, you know, my, my, my parents said, you know, Harvard, Yale, or Annapolis, because we know they have sterling reputations, but there are other resources that you can consult where they, there may be other institutions with sterling reputations for particular majors. Belonging is incredibly important. Now, you, we've talked a lot about external pressures put upon students, but you know your kids, and when it comes to college, students are their own biggest critics and their own worst enemies. And they are not going to tell you that, but you know that to be the case. Um, so whatever you're thinking, they've already thought about it. So that's why it's so important to be a, a good cheerleader and really point out Resilience, engaging with college early, we talked about that. Um, and really always letting your kids know that no matter where they go, that you're going to be proud of them and that they belong at the university, that they are resilient and they will get through. Because I'll tell you what, your first year on a UC campus, it can be very lonely and it can be very confusing. And you know we have a lot of resources, but we rely a lot upon the students who come in to find them. So it's important that you are there to remind them that, yeah, you belong here. You got in there. You are resilient and you're going to push through and make it through. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, this idea, um, what you are looking at, actually, I, I want to make sure that I mention this. This is Verducci Hall. This is the first dorm I ever lived in. This used to be at San Francisco State before they tore it down because of asbestos and a number of other concerns. Used to be an old Holiday Inn. And I show this picture to you, and you'll see in the background is, is Lake Merced, is because I had a lot of doubts and second thoughts in this dorm where I thought, this is not for me. I don't belong here. I don't know what I am doing. It's important for you to know as parents that doubts and second thoughts are commonplace. You, even today, even today when I go into the office, when I go onto campus, I'm thinking, do I really belong here? You know, some of it has to do with imposter syndrome, which is runs rampant. Um, but uh, 
that is, is commonplace. Um, now, the nature of university work is very intensive. If you come to a place like UC San Diego, it's not as though all of the professors consult with one another to say, oh, let's make sure they have a, you know, sort of a school life balance. They don't care. Uh, they are going to just pile work on top of your son's or daughters. So you may think, okay, even though they've gone to school down the road, why aren't they coming home? Why don't they come home to visit or what's going on? Um, even though they're not there, know that they care. They're trying to navigate um, this new experience. And we have a lot of parents who worry that if you go onto a, a campus and you're meeting new people and, you know, there's a lot of talk about professors who indoctrinate and what if they forget what you, what I taught them, trust me that they will always retain the values that you've instilled and they're going to use those values to navigate new experiences and ways of thinking. It's not as though they just say, okay, that was my old life and now this is my new life. Um, so do rest assured that those remain um, within them. Um, some of the essential skills for post-secondary education. It's interesting because it may not be what you had imagined them to be. Because when I was going, I thought, well, I have to be an expert in everything. I have to uh, be able to, you know, uh, do differential equations and, and I, all of this sort of stuff and, and, and write like Shakespeare. What our faculties are telling us is that the essential skills are much like the essential skills that industry is asking for. The ability to collaborate. Can you work together as a team? Used to be that the, the, the college endeavor was a very lonely endeavor where you would do things uh, very much on your own, but now it's a lot more collaborative. Um, communication and interpersonal skills. I have a genius of a nephew who did uh, graduated magna cum laude from UC Davis in a double major. He did not go to graduate school because he never learned how to communicate. So he could never ask a professor for a recommendation because he never learned that kind of skill. So that is so, so very important as well. Problem solving. And that doesn't mean sort of, you know, uh, you know, deconstructing the genome or, or solving an equation. It means how do I actually solve problems out in the real world? How do I, I get through things? How do I manage time? And believe me, if you don't learn that in your first year, you're never gonna learn it. Leadership and, and preparation for what is to come. Those are the things that will get you through. Now, I know that there is going to be a time we used to call it the thick envelope and the thin envelope. And if you got the thick envelope, there was a general feeling of joy. If you got the thin envelope, it was a cause for concern because usually the thin envelope said, thank you for applying. Unfortunately, you know, we had a, hundreds of, of brilliant applicants and um, for, you were not among them. Of course, they would not say it like that. Um, but what happens if you do get the rejection letter? It's easy to fall into a funk. So one of the things you wanna make sure that you do is to use the growth mindset approaches that, that we talked about, that idea about persevering. It feels personal, but it is nothing personal. Um, I know that in our last go, I believe we had 115,000 applications um, for undergraduate at UC San Diego. Um, and every, every application, everybody had a, a 5.7 GPA and he served a term in Congress, cured a disease, wrote a bestseller and a hit song, and still we had to reject them. So really it is nothing personal. It's important to celebrate the acceptance letters. It's easier to say, well, I have five rejections and only four acceptances and not all of them were my first choice skills change the mindset, celebrate the acceptance and embrace the schools that accepted you. Remember, acceptance and rejection are a two-way street because for every rejection letter you get, you're probably getting an acceptance letter that you're rejecting them. It's easy to waste energy on what ifs. 
what if I had done it this way? Or what if I had written a more compelling essay? I should have. And it's very easy to fall into that spiral. Um, so don't waste energies on what ifs. And you know what? You're not alone. Uh, I always used to think um, that, uh, you know, whenever you're going through something bad, knowing that somebody else is right there with you makes it a little bit less bad. So when you think about being audited by the IRS, knowing that there are hundreds of other people who are probably being audited doesn't make it okay, but it makes you feel a little bit better. Well, you know who else has been rejected um, by schools? Isaac Asimov, the, the, the amazing science fiction writer rejected by Columbia. Tom Hanks, uh, uh, America's treasure, uh, uh, an unparalleled star in Hollywood, rejected MIT. Barack Obama, one of our, our greatest presidents and, and an, an absolute shining star in our constellation, um, rejected by Swarthmore. Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, who produced movies starring Tom Hanks, rejected from film school at USC and UCLA. So if you are rejected, you are in good company. Um, so you are not alone. And there are always alternatives in the immediate. There's community college, there's gap years. You know, don't, I, it, it's easy to be upset. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be disappointed, but you can't sort of dwell on it. Now, once you do get accepted, the next big thing is the major. The weird thing about universities is what we do is we accept you and we say, look at all of this great stuff we have here. Look at all of the great stuff you can do. Look, you can be a painter, you can be a performer, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be um, an artist, you can be a politician, you can be an economist. And look at all this great stuff. But before you get here, you need to decide what is that great stuff you're going to do. You got to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. So you will find that your kids switch majors. I switched majors probably every semester because I was now there are kids out there who are multi potentials They're good at everything and they love to do everything and it's hard for them to decide. You have other kids who start out thinking I'm going pre-med, they get into their first OCHEM, OCHEM class and say, I'm not going to be pre-med, I'm going into the humanities. Um, but there are others where it's easy to be lured by a, you know, a, um, a, a wonderful professor who just brings things to life and you go, that's what I wanna do. It's important to know that the major you choose neither predicts nor guarantees your future. Many graduates find jobs that have nothing to do with what they studied in college. I studied political science in college. I dabble occasionally, I vote, but that's really about it. Um, when we look at Department of Labor statistics, the average 20 something switches jobs once every three years. The, this idea of prepping for the job that you will eventually retire from and get the gold watch and spend 20 years, um, that is not really uh, the, the, the case anymore. And the average person changes career fields two or three times in their lifetime. In my grandfather's day, absolutely unheard of. He was a lithographer. He was a lithographer at 17. He was a lithographer at 70. You just don't change. But nowadays, things are a lot more fluid. So, you know, if you, if you find yourself in a major and thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of your life, um, that could be the case. Um, again, growth mindset is so incredibly important. And when you talk to admissions officers, they will always talk about the benefits of adapting to changing circumstances above anything else, adapting to change. And you know who's really good at it? Everybody, because everybody had to do that last year. Learning through experience, um, looking at, at, at talents that are applicable across multiple disciplines in career, all of those metacognitive skills that you've been, you've been working on that we've been talking about, um, a growth mindset was ranked as the most important essential skill for career success. 
So all of these practices that, that your kids are undertaking at E3, they're going to last. They are just going to grow and they're going to last. Most essential skills, motivation and commitment. Motivation is a thread that is throughout. Commitment, to, you know, if you're going to start on this journey, keep on this journey. It doesn't mean that you're not going to wander from time to time, but you always go back. Enthusiasm. It's going to be very important because that's what's going to get you up for your 8 a.m. classes. Keep going. Um, ambition and goals, talents, attendance is, is a huge thing. Um, I think it was Woody Allen who said 90% of life is just showing up. Well, this is a very important thing. Critical thinking uh, above and beyond the most important. Now, I also want to quickly showcase um, that are available to you. Um, one is Admit One, and that is through a partnership with San Diego Public Library. And Dr. Ward, I don't know if we, we may have Admit One at E3, which is our college prep, test prep, college counseling type of program. If we don't have it at E3, we should probably find a way to get it at E3. Um, right now, it's a partnership between the libraries. It's delivered online through the library system, and it is um, test prep but it is also college counseling, finding goodness of fit, uh, getting ready for college, helping kids get ready for college, um, you know, in an environment uh, that is, uh, you know, with peers where they can share concerns. On uh, university, and let me just um, show you this, uh, through the education channel at uh, UCTV. Now, I've, I've given you sort of a, uh, some of the broad strokes, but there are a lot of details. I want to show you this um, connection. Hopefully, it, it links in. Um, let, let me see if I can share it here. And what this is, um, these are 15-minute programs about um, uh, items that are college relevant. So Stephen Mercer is our head college counseling instructor. He runs our college counseling program. And there are a lot of programs for parents, um, writing essays, um, uh, financial aid, advice for parents around the college application process, um, uh, how to choose a college, what is the future of standardized testing, um, if you're a junior, here's some advice for you. So there are a lot of resources there uh, that we can uh, connect you to as well as on our campus. So let me just um, go back to where we were. Um, that is always available to you. And I want to be cognizant of our time or any questions uh, that you have. You know where to find me if you need me and happy to share more information about uh, college going and to answer your questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Appel. This has been absolutely informative and